Today our uh, subject is North Korea, and joining me in our conversation is Professor uh, Gilbert Rosman, Musgrove Professor of Sociology at Princeton University. Welcome, Professor Rosman. I'm glad to be to here. Our program. I thought we should start by uh, doing a little bit of a country profile. Tell us a little bit about North Korea. How big is it? How rich or poor? Well, the first thing I should say is I specialize in all the countries around North Korea. I analyze their views of uh, North Korea and regional issues. So I have not been to North Korea, and I don't consider myself an expert on North Korea, but I do follow the, the basic uh, information. Mm -hmm. And North Korea is a country of about 23 million people mm -hmm. uh, with a, uh, a, a, a economy that uh, peaked in the late 80s. Uh, and once rivaled the South Korean economy in the 70s, for instance, but now has fallen to about one thirtieth the level of the South Korean economy, and so its uh, its total economy is just measured in uh, in, in level of about five hundred dollars per capita. What caused the drop? Well, uh, they lost their uh, economic linkages. Uh, to the Soviet Union and China when the Soviet Union collapsed and the Soviets changed the their foreign Earth, policy. In 1991. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. And then China insisted mm -hmm. on switching to market uh, relations instead of the planned economic relations that earlier existed. Uh, it has a tremendous shortage of energy uh, and so its factories can't operate uh, very much. Uh, so the economy really has limped along for well over a decade. And now basically has no industry to, to speak of and, and they don't have enough food if it, and they mm. depend on China and Korea for food? Uh, well, they've uh, received quite a bit of humanitarian assistance from the United States too. They uh, do? What they, type of? They have until uh, recently. The United States, has in, even when the nuclear crisis began, said we're not going to link food assistance, which basically helps poor people survive uh, with the nuclear crisis, uh, although lately there has been some change because of the extreme behavior in North Korea. So they've received uh, food assistance and they also buy some food from China. They, they do have factories that operate, but they have uh, many do not. They don't export any mm -hmm. significant industrial production. Mm -hmm. but, but see, some three million people died uh, in the 1990s. So, so we, we heard reports say that, give the number because of uh, mass starvation. Well, that, that is correct. There are some people, um, it seems like well over a million, maybe a considerably higher number died. Uh, the figures have never been well um, confirmed. confirmed or verified. Uh, but we know there, there has been serious famine and there is the danger of famine again next year because uh, last year's uh, crop was, was rather good, but this, this recent crop is, is not, was not good. And so uh, then they had a little bit of flooding over the summer, including uh, some deaths mm -hmm. from that. So we, we expect uh, that they are in, in danger again. Uh, South Korea has provided uh, as assistance fertilizer as well as food, helping their agricultural sector somewhat. Uh, but they've just uh, limped along in agriculture. Mm -hmm. Now, North Korea is the world's most isolated country. I agree with that. Uh, why, 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 why does its leader, Kim Jong-il, keep it that way? Uh, the m main reason, I, I think, mm -hmm. is the fear that uh, opening the country would lead to regime collapse. Uh, that this is a regime that is the most extreme form of totalitarianism and it's based on uh, deception of its own population and teaching them to have a, an unquestioned belief in the near divine status of its leader and past leader uh, and therefore uh, the threat to the system of opening up is considerable and they've also drawn lessons from other systems that have opened up particularly the Soviet one and they recognize that their conditions are such that the danger of collapse, particularly with South Korea sitting there as the alternative, another Korean nation that is so such a sharp contrast, uh, and therefore they're they're understandably fearful. But does he enjoy popular support within the country? Well, we have no public opinion surveys. 
Uh, we people all wear uh, Kim Jong Il uh, lapel buttons. Uh, they have pictures up in their houses. Mm -hmm. They've been taught uh, to revere their leader, and many of them, uh, when they become refugees, are confused. So it does seem that yes, they uh, a lot of them have not heard enough of a, a dissonant message to uh, to take a perspective that would be extremely critical of their leader. Now, uh, in October of uh, 2006, North Korea exploded its first, what it says, its first bomb, nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. How long have, have they had this nuclear program? <coughs> well, there were origins of the program in the 1950s. Uh, and uh, they ha got assistance from their socialist allies in building nuclear reactors. Uh, and China, Russia? That's right, particularly the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Soviet Union uh, accelerated its assistance in the mid-80s, just as Gorbachev was coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, <coughs> it reversed course, uh, and the North Koreans informed uh, the Soviet diplomats as early as 1990 that they would have no choice but to develop nuclear weapons if the Soviets changed their foreign policy and recognized South Korea. But, but, but this, this nuclear uh, bomb test, would you, do you share the view, uh, some people have this view that, uh, that the test is a direct response of President George W. Bush's axis of evil rhetoric that it so scared North Korea that it, it, it sought to, uh, to, to, to gain the best means of protecting itself. Uh, I, I agree with the view that what we see happening is a kind of diplomatic and military preparedness exchange. Mm -hmm. That is that North Korea is interested in, uh, in getting from the United States both uh, security guarantees, so the regime does not fear collapse, and uh, an open door to international economic assistance. Uh, and they are using their nuclear card uh, to n improve their negotiating stance. Basically, it's blackmail, a nice way to put it, though, you. Um, in, in, in some respects, it's blackmail. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, uh, they are saying that uh, if we make a deal, they are willing to, uh, to uh, control, and they even promise, although people aren't sure to whether to believe them, that they will eliminate their nuclear programs. It's also said that um, Kim Jong-il has this nuclear program as a, as a, as a focus to unite its people, uh, that to say, well, our country faces an external threat, and therefore we need this in order to mm -hmm. deal with that situation. I think that uh, is the case. Uh, he, it, it, he, he's made this into a, a symbol of national pride and national power and national resistance mm -hmm. to the so-called pressure uh, or strategy of the United States to overthrow the regime. Uh, and uh, I, I think that, that sometimes has effect, at least in the short run. Uh, he, so he, he does find ways to rally public opinion. How much of a threat, though, uh, to America and to the world hmm. is a nuclear North Korea? Uh, it is a threat. And uh, if it's not only a nuclear North Korea, but an outcast society <coughs> that is not brought into <coughs> international and regional uh, accords, and it has nothing uh, uh, to, uh, to trade to the world, uh, there are chances of proliferation are higher, mm -hmm. and the chances of uh, more serious forms of blackmail uh, are also uh, increased. Uh, so it, it is a major threat to the region uh, and to the world if uh, no action is taken. Now, that the only, there are mo there's more than one way to respond. Mm -hmm. There's a way to try to neutralize the threat through regional diplomacy, uh, and the six-party talks have the potential to do that if they're handled the right way and to try to rally other countries to support uh, engagement with the North within, with limits, 
also to pressure the North to abandon its nuclear program. Uh, and so that was essentially the Clinton approach in the 1990s when but the danger was recognized. But Clinton also gave North Korea assurances that America will not attack it. Uh, that is right, and Bush has also said repeatedly, we're not going to attack North Korea. So, so, so you're of the view that the six-party talks are a good, many people say it's the best forum to resolve the North Korean? Well, I think the six-party talks are not a panacea. When people say it's the best forum, uh, I think they have in mind that working together with the other concerned countries creates the best opportunity to resolve this issue. I regard the six-party talks as the most ex important negotiating format in the world since the end of the Cold War. And uh, yet, they, if they fail, the loss will be tremendous. I think not just for North Korea, but for the whole region not being able to work together. And the levels of mistrust have been rising within the region uh, in the shadow of unsuccessful six-party talks. But if they succeed, we establish a, a framework for regional cooperation in an area where there are four great powers, the four most assertive great powers in the world, struggling for uh, increased influence and leadership. Uh, where there uh, is four powers are the United States, mm -hmm. China, mm -hmm. Japan, and Russia. Mm -hmm. So all of these four countries mm -hmm. take this crisis very seriously. Mm. They regard it as extremely important for their own uh, national defense and national interest. It also means that these powers, if they can figure out a way to work together and stabilize the situation and create a regional security framework, uh, can then move on to dealing with each other in a more, um, a more positive fashion on other issues. This will help create a framework for the region that's most economically dynamic in the world to, to begin to uh, move towards regionalism. So what, what should these countries bring to the table? What should they well, they all have uh, different sanctions? national interests. Sanctions are important after the nuclear crisis. Uh, uh, and they're now each country is uh, developing and announcing uh, sanctions in accord with the United Nations resolution of Security Council Re resolution of October 14th following the nuclear test. So we all have agreed that some sanctions should be carried out. But there's so much disagreement about what those sanctions should be or how to enforce them that it's quite uncertain that sanctions would have a great effect. Yeah, because I found this uh, very interesting quote by Fareed Zakaria, the um, mm -hmm. uh, columnist. Uh, she says, sanctions by themselves have had little success in the nuclear arena. Consider the countries that have chosen to give up their nuclear program. Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Belarus, South Africa, Brazil, and Argentina. In all these cases, what worked was mainly a positive incentive, not a punishment. These countries agreed to give up their nuclear status because they got something in return. Well, that's what the Chinese have been arguing, and the Russians, and the South Koreans. They've all been saying that the leverage over North Korea with its very isolated economy and its leadership having so absolute control and uh, the people uh, ex having to accept uh, dire conditions and potentially even more dire conditions, uh, we're not going to be able to make sanctions work uh, uh, by themselves. But uh, posit and, and besides, we won't be able to get the other countries to agree on proceeding with sanctions without trying a more uh, positive approach to stress what are the incentives, the carrots as well as the sticks. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. since the uh, beginning of the crisis, even before then, we've been getting a lot of encouragement uh, from the other countries for a, a more forthcoming negotiating posture from the United States. Uh, and China has, of course, been in the lead in these negotiations. Yeah, of course, China and South Korea have their, their very strong reasons not to go the stiff sanctions route mm -hmm. because they're worried about a regime collapse when you, it could happen, couldn't it? Well, I think they're not only worried about that, but they're worried about uh, uh, threats to stability in the region 
from uh, the military in North Korea becoming more uh, more extreme. They have a very big, big military, don't they? That's right. Over a million people are part of the armed forces. Mm -hmm. they, their country puts military, uh, the military first. Uh, and Kim Jong-il is seen to uh, not only be very dependent on the military, but having, but being forced to listen to the military. And one reason the nuclear test may have occurred is the military put pressure on him, saying that uh, there were, his policies were failing, and now it was time to try something different. I would think that um, uh, China and uh, South Korea uh, have an expectation that North Korea is so desperate for financial aid and for stabilization politically that it, it would accept positive incentives. And so they've been telling the Bush administration since the first months when Kim Dae-jong, the president of South Korea, visited Washington, um, some say prematurely, and found that uh, he wasn't really welcome, and, and the response to him actually set back his policies rather than uh, uh, providing some continuity. Uh, when Ken, he came to the United States trying to deliver a message, and he was uh, resisted. Uh, would you say that a military attack on North Korea to take out its nuclear um, program is out of the question? I think under extreme circumstances, it, it's not out of the question. If, if and there's who, a, who, will, who will initiate the attack? Well, the view is that the United States might do it without adequate consultations, and the, the losers would be Japan, South Korea, and the region, because North Korea is capable uh, with its uh, more than 10,000 artillery pieces, very heavy artillery pieces, within range of the Seoul metropolitan area. Uh, where uh, nearly half the population of South Korea and most of its economy are centered, uh, North Korea is capable of uh, devastating uh, this area. It's also capable of hitting Japan, maybe even with nuclear weapons. Probably not, but because we don't think they're miniaturized, but certainly with other weapons of mass destruction uh, and U.S. bases. And so this is regarded as a last resort uh, and uh, one that, uh, if the U.S. tried, would probably put it at odds with all of the countries in the region. I see. So, so that option is not off the table. Uh, it is. It's not off the table as something that might occur if North Korea's behavior were uh, more extreme than it's been. Um, but it's certainly off the table for the foreseeable future as efforts are advancing to try a combination of uh, reopening the six-party talks that have been announced to uh, resume uh, two days from, from this, or three days from this interview, uh, or four days, I should say, on December 18th, and also for um, uh, the possibility that uh, sanctions, uh, some kind of economic sanctions, will go forward if those talks are not progressing. Yes. And, and I think I'd like to hear a little bit more about incentives. Mm -hmm. what, what incentives do you think that the parties need to bring to the table? Because North well, Korea has, has had very specific uh, requests, the things that they want. They, uh, they put at the top of their list um, some kind of written guarantee for the security of the regime. Uh, they also non-aggression guarantees. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, we've uh, and in the fall of nineteen of uh, two thousand and three, uh, in the uh, relatively early stage of the crisis, uh, President Bush did say that he's prepared to give an oral guarantee. So there's been some movement on the U.S. side, uh, as well as frequent mention that we will we will make it very clear that we will not attack the North. But we haven't uh, solved that uh, difference of opinion. Uh, they're looking for a substantial economic uh, support, investment. Uh, I thinking, I'm thinking uh, probably a lot more than, than some people expect. Uh, and this is a kind of reward for abandoning their nuclear program. But my own view is that they're really hoping that there'll be an opportunity to prop up their regime without outside forces putting pressure on them over human rights. Uh, which makes it very difficult for uh, many people, particularly in the United States, to accept this kind of deal. Mm -hmm. Because we're essentially allowing 
what we regard as evil to persist. And we're also helping to create a multilateral security uh, arrangement that in some way reduces the, um, the impact of our alliance, alliance system, mm -hmm. that some new system is going to be emerging, and that North Korea is now going to be um, sort of the ward uh, of all the states of the region, uh, increasing the clout of China and Russia, which are two partners, and also changing the psychology in South Korea uh, towards the north. Uh, so this is very difficult to, to recognize from our side. North Korea has for years uh, asked to and wanted to have direct one-on-one -on -one talks with the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, the United States has refused. Uh, why, why is that? Uh, I think that uh, you think this it should, is, this is it the should Bush take place. Yes, mm -hmm. I think, uh, but I, that doesn't mean I, I think we should bypass the six-party format. I right. think the talk should supplement that format. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think that this has only been the Bush administration that's refused. It wasn't true earlier, uh, and I think it's refused basically because it doesn't want to make the concessions for the compromises that North Korea is seeking and therefore it sees that these talks would fail. Uh, but the Bush administration... What compromises does the Bush administration demand of the North Koreans? Well, they want uh, uh, what they call CVID, Comprehensive, Verifiable, Irreversible uh, Denuclearization, uh, including uh, identification and agreement to give up and allow full inspection for the highly enriched uranium program that was detected uh, after um, the Bush administration took office. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we've moved some way towards recognizing the North's request for bilateral meetings. Uh, we've, uh, in the context of the six-party talks, uh, there have been more and more uh, direct two-way meetings between uh, our negotiator, now Chris Hill, Chris Hill, and the North Korean negotiator. Uh, and there's talk now if um, uh, the December 18th uh, meeting uh, starts uh, adequately, we, there would be recess, there would be subgroups formed, and there might even be a Chris Hill visit to North Korea. So you are actually quite hopeful. I'm not quite hopeful. You're not. Um, I think that there is a basis for going forward. Mm -hmm. I'm not optimistic at this point that either the Bush administration or the Kim Jong-il administration in North Korea is prepared to make the compromises for reaching that compromise, that, new, that sort of intermediate solution. I do think that if diplomats in our country were handling the negotiations rather than uh, having uh, uh, Vice oh. President Dick Cheney have a veto as he's had over in, in, in past years, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the chances would be greater. I think that if we uh, work closely with the other parties, what I call the other four, particularly China and South Korea, mm -hmm. the chances would be greater. Mm -hmm. I think there's been some movement and improvement, main, partly because of the urgency for the U.S. to deal with other crises, uh, In, regard, Iran, Iraq, Iran and Iraq, Iran, Iran as and da very dangerous. I think these are more dangerous situations. Afghanistan is a mm -hmm is uh, on a, uh, on the bad situation, but it's at the level of danger is far, far lower for, for the, the future of our country. Uh, looking at East Asia as a whole, mm -hmm. what do you see as its future direction? Do you see the, the, the region growing more stable and peaceful because of growing economic prosperity? People don't want to fight once they're rich? Uh, or, or do you think that the, do you see the region becoming less stable um, because of the many geopolitical rivalries, tensions, and competitions? Uh, I think the main geopolitical tension in the region will be between, be between China and Japan. The United States will strongly back Japan and yet will also have good reason to work with China to create more stability in the region and beyond. Therefore, this region will not overcome these geopolitical divisions. Nonetheless, there are ways of stabilizing these divisions. Just as I think the North Korean nuclear crisis can be more or less stabilized, which was what 
uh, Bill Clinton tried to do in the late 90s without fully resolving the problem. I think Bush has moved significantly to try to stabilize the Taiwan Strait uh, uh, problem rather than allowing uh, the potential for uh, a violent confrontation to, mm -hmm. uh, to grow. Uh, and, uh, so, but I don't think that it will be easy for China and Japan to agree on how to divide up regional leadership and how to deal with uh, the various contested areas, whether Southeast Asia or uh, South Korea. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, we can't find solutions that will reduce these tensions and allow this region with its tremendous prosperity uh, to be a very important positive force in the world so we can concentrate on the regions that are most likely to be prob problematic primarily the Middle East. What do you see as America's future in the region? Do you see American influence wane uh, as the Asian countries rise? I think their American influence has been waning since the early 90s and will continue to wane. Uh, economically, the balance has been shifting. Militarily, there's some shift in the balance. Our soft power has diminished considerably in recent years. But that doesn't mean the United States doesn't remain for at least the next decades as the, uh, the predominant power in the region. Uh, we have a great opportunity to help structure multilateral regional institutions where we are part of the uh, answer rather than excluding us. Uh, we also have a lot of economic leverage. Uh, as regionalism emerges, we can, uh, instead of fighting it, we can say uh, there are ways in which it can be supportive of our objectives in globalization. So I think uh, the U.S. is at a crossroads. Do we uh, accept the changes in the region and try to find a way of steering them in ways that are most favorable to us? Or do we approach this with thinking that originated at a time when uh, there was a Cold War or when we felt that we were easily the most dominant country and could shape the region pretty mm -hmm. much as we wanted? It's, it's no longer a unipolar uh, world. This region in particular is not unipolar. Yeah. If there are other places in the world where you could still talk about unipolarity, this region is multipolarity more than any other region. Mm -hmm. We have so many great powers and middle powers and, uh, and diverse influences. Uh, and so uh, we, we can build on the strong Japanese-U.S. alliance that gives us uh, added influence in this region, but we have to be wary of accepting divisive forces that come uh, by concentrating primar primarily or solely on that alliance. That's all we have time for, I'm afraid. Thank you so much, Professor Gil uh, Rosman, Gil Rosman of Princeton University. I'm Mei Chang for International Forum. Thank you for watching. See you next time.